Hi, this is Mrs. Brown from Research Triangle High School. The purpose of today's presentation is to talk a little bit about who the Anglo-Saxons were and specifically how their culture is related to the epic poem Beowulf. Now, if you think about a map of England, we're going to go back and look at the different parts that were occupied because the Anglo-Saxons came from three actual different tribes. You had the Angles who were up in the north and kind of the Midland sections, what was known at the time as Northumbria, Mercia, and East Anglia. The Saxons were in the south and what is today Wessex, Essex, and Sussex, and then there were the Jews who were in the very southern province, which would eventually become the Kingdom of Kent. So if you look at the map, you can kind of see some of the migration that happened from the Scandinavian areas and where these various people settled as they came in and occupied uh, the British territories. So if you look back over the history of the island that we call England today, you see the ancient Britain, and that's sort of the time of the pagans, where you think of things like Stonehenge, and we'll talk more about those guys later on. Then there was the Roman period, where the Romans came in and governed and did a lot of building and uh, set up societies. And then there was the Roman, um, when the Romans withdrew, we saw the Anglo-Saxons invade and the beginning of what we consider to be English, uh, the English language today. And then finally, the ad adaptation of the Anglo-Saxon culture, including some of their religion and social order, and the beginning of this literary tradition, which was followed by a second Viking invasion. So if we divide these up a little bit, we're going to look at ancient Britain, which would go from about uh, 2000 BC up to about 43 AD. And this is the time, again, that it would have been inhabited by the Natan Britons and by what we consider today to be the Celtic people. Uh, you, they were mostly farmers and hunters. Society was managed and organized by clans that had chieftains that would be elected, usually from the pagan priests. And the priests were also known as the Druids. So if you've heard of those kinds of uh, things before, that's the time period that we're talking about. Now, if we move up to about 43 to about 449 AD, we have Claudius, who came in with the Romans and conquered Britain. And at this time, the Romans actually brought quite a bit of order to this kind of pagan land. They brought in their law. They brought in all of this Roman culture, a lot of the comforts, things like water and, and um, um, the way of building things and building the roads and the Latin language to the land. And the Celts actually became very Romanized during this time. A lot of little tribal disputes topped because the Romans were such strong, um, were such a strong government that they kind of cracked down on all of that. And many of the Britons were converted to Christianity along with the rest of the Roman Empire around 4th century. And at the 5th century, Rome decided that it was having trouble back at home and couldn't really maintain these outer, um, outer, uh, bastions of the of the Roman society and they withdrew all of their troops and all of their peoples and called them back into mainland Europe and kind of left Britain without this strong government anymore. So if you kind of think about what happens to a classroom when the teacher leaves and nobody's quite sure where they are or when they're coming back and things can start to get a little bit wild, that's really a lot of what happened in Rome because after the Romans left, the native Britons were really vulnerable. There was nobody protecting them anymore from these kinds of invaders and there was nobody to kind of keep the order within the country. And over the next hundred years, we saw Britons invaded again and again by these seafaring tribes that came out of this Germanic tradition. And these were known as the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jews. The invasion forced the natives to actually retreat up to what's Wales today, and we consider this um, Old English period beginning around 449. Now, just like the Romans had done before them, the Anglo-Saxons brought a lot of their culture with them, including these legends about these ancient Germanic heroes and kings, these um, way of celebrating these stories through um, these long epic poems that were sung by a gleeman or what was known as a scop. And the scops are kind of the equivalent of the modern day sort of court gesture or bard who would tell these long histories, and often accompanied in song by a harp or a lyre. And these things were not written down yet. They were mostly for entertainment, but also kept the history alive. They're a way to teach the new warriors what was expected of them, uh, to tell these legends of these older kings and, and uh, people who had fought for the culture. And the kings would entertain people in these huge mead halls, and mead hall is named for 
the drink mead. Today we would call it maybe a beer hall. But mead was a drink that was made from fermented honey and was drunk in these halls. So everyone would gather after these large battles into these huge halls, sit around and drink and tell all of these stories about past warriors and kings. In the epic poem Beowulf, you're going to hear a lot of stories about the mead hall, Herat. Now, before the Anglo-Saxon culture converted to Christianity, they were pagans, and they had a couple of very specific ideas about how the world worked. One was that every human life was in the hands of fate, and fate was controlled by the ancient Germanic gods. And these are people that you may have heard of um, from like the Norwegian traditions, the Scandinavian traditions, Tiu, who was the god of war in the sky, Woden, the chief of the gods, and Freya, Woden's wife. It's actually from their names that we get some of the words for our days of the week. Tuesday was Tours Day, Wednesday was Woden's Day, Friday was Freya's Day. So some of that part of that culture is still preserved. The Anglo-Saxon society was organized by warriors. Warriors were the most important part of the group. And the chief warriors were known as earls or thanes. But these warriors protected a small group, usually was family or some sort of family connections, but were devoted to the king and would give their allegiance to the king. The king was chosen by the Witan, which was a council of elders. So the king was kind of elected in a lot of ways. Um, there was also a class of freemen that were known as churls and slaves who were known as thralls. Women were considered to be the peace weavers, the word woman that came out of this idea of the peace weavers, because through marriage, women would knit the families together and could stop these tribes from attacking each other because now they would become family through the, through the marriages. Now, when Augustine arrived in about 597 AD, all of England pretty much converted to Christianity at that point. Um, there's still obviously pockets of pagan that came in, but the whole culture became Christian. And Augustine started by converting King Ethelbert of Kent, who came out of this Anglo-Saxon tradition. The rest of England followed, and we saw this rise of the monasteries being built. And by 731, the culture of Christianity was really what you would find all over the land. Now, the religious orders were not just for the religion, they were also the keepers of the culture and the history. And in monastery, monasteries, the scribes, which comes from the word to write, would produce these books by hand. Now, the books were usually religious in nature, about the saints' lives, but would also started to copy down some of these stories that had traditionally been told around the meat halls in the evenings. And even though these were Christian scribes, they started to collect these Anglo-Saxon culture. And um, that's how we get these stories of things like Beowulf today. It actually came out of the church and out of Christianity because these, monast because these um, monks were available to copy them down. Uh, the father of English history was known as a, was a Northumbrian monk who was known as the Venerable Bede, who actually uh, is thought to have uh, collected and scribed many of these stories. So what can we learn about the Anglo-Saxons from these stories that have come down? Well, we can take a look at some of their values. One of them was this idea of heroism and kingship, the relationship between a king and their thanes, the idea that a king owed protection to these people, and in return, the people owed their loyalty and their allegiance, and if necessary, their lives to their king as well. Weir guild was known as a man price, and it was actually something that you were expected to get paid if you killed some, or if a member of your family was killed. And it's interesting that after the arrival of Christianity, a lot of these same themes stayed in place, but instead of what you owe the king and what the king owes to you, became the relationship with God. So what does God, what do people owe to God and what does God deliver or do for their people? Another thing that you see a lot in Anglo-Saxon stories is this concept of weird, which is where we get the word weird from, or fate, which is the control of your destiny, um, who's in charge and what's going to happen to you. And then the concept of exile. Now, in a land where your very survival, because of all these invaders and all of the harsh living conditions, depended on having your clan around you to protect you, being abandoned or apart from your tribe or from your society was the harshest punishment.
Now let's talk a little bit about the Danish invasion, this very specific time that this group came over into what we think of today as the English Isles. Uh, we had these Vikings, again, who were warriors, and carried over these ideas, and they, they really created a lot of destruction, a lot of fear. People never knew when the raid was going to happen. And even though England, the tribes tried to defend themselves, a lot of England, only the Saxon kingdom of Wessex actually was able to fight the Danes back. The rest of them all fell to these, um, to these invading Vikings. Now, archaeologists have found a lot of evidence of these people and the kind of lives that they lead. And you can see in some of these pictures some of the items and artifacts that have been found. You can see the kind of um, helmets that would be used, a shield, some of the sword hilts, for example. Uh, so the fighters don't look anything like we think of as armored fighters today, but they did have some simple protections that they used in battles. Now, there's actually this amazing site that archaeologists found of this typical Anglo-Saxon village. And you can actually travel to England to this place called Westow and see some of this kind of recreation on some of the original sites of what this kind of lifestyle would have looked like. So a lot of what we think of as English culture really comes a lot out of this Viking and Scandinavian raids, um, sort of combined with some of the things that we saw from early Christianity. And of course, one of the things that we do have is the very word English comes from the Angles. And a lot of the language and things are still rooted in that tradition. So we gain several words, including things like sheep, shepherd, ox, earth, plow, swine, dog, field. And if you look at the words that come from the Anglo-Saxon, you can sort of get a guess about what type of work and things were important to these people. We also have words like glee and laughter and mirth and merry that come out from the Old English. In fact, over a hundred of the most common words that we use in modern English actually come from the Old English, including our most basic sentence building words, such as the verbs to be and all of its iterations like is and are, or is are, um, the words the and you um, all come from this Old English, um, Old English tradition.